Good morning, and welcome to NACDL's webinar, Privilege Means Privilege, Keeping the Government Out of Your Digital Devices at the Border. Uh, my name is Jumana Musa. I'm the Senior Counsel for Privacy and National Security here at NACDL. And we are joined this morning by Aisha Bendari, who's a staff attorney with the ACLU's Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. Uh, she focuses on litigation and advocacy that relates to online speech, academic freedom, privacy rights, and the impact of big data. And in particular, she is counsel for the plaintiffs in Al Assad versus Duke, which is a case that is challenging the current iteration of Customs and Border Protection searching digital devices at the border. It has, ha it has been going on for some time that Customs and Border Protection has decided to treat digital devices as they do your suitcases or your handbags. So when you are crossing the border, whether at an airport or a land crossing, that they can open it, poke around inside ostensibly to ensure you're not violating laws, bringing in um, you know, plants that don't belong, smuggling drugs and other things, but they've decided to take that same theory and apply it to digital devices. The protections for your digital devices at the border are very few, and the acknowledgement that attorneys carry privileged materials is almost non-existent. And so she's going to talk us through how does the government approach this, where is the state of the case uh, of case law on this issue, but also some of the things you can do to protect your clients' rights and your ethical obligations as you travel uh, for your cases, as your investigators travel or, travel, or as even witnesses are coming in to testify in cases. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Aisha. Thank you so much, Jumana. Um, my goal for today is to provide an overview of the legal framework that applies at the border, the state of the law and the contested issues that are out there, and then to focus on practical tips for you as lawyers, as investigators, as people with privileged material who travel across the border, um, what you can, what steps you can take, uh, what choices you have to make, and then how to evaluate all of this in light of the ethical obligations that are at play. So to start, um, I'll just describe what we mean by searches of digital devices at the border. <clears throat> when, when we talk about this issue, we are referring to searches of the content of devices. Uh, we're not talking about the type of search that involves ascertaining what you're actually carrying. So for example, um, looking at a phone or a laptop to see if it is in fact a phone or a laptop, or the kind of physical search that happens that is equivalent to the search of luggage. Uh, our focus and our concern is on searches of the contents contained on those devices. And there can be different searches that happen. One type of search that could happen at the border is uh, what we might call a cursory or a manual search. And uh, this would mean that an agent um, to whom you present your phone uh, looks through the phone, um, maybe looks at the, the information that is viewable uh, easily um, just by flipping through it, perhaps a list of contacts, perhaps photos, things that might show up. Um, but it could also involve the agent doing something a little more complicated than that, such as using a built-in search function that's available on a phone to search for text or search for um, particular language. Uh, so as, as I'll talk about a little more, the line between a so-called cursory or manual search and a uh, forensic search isn't so clear, although the case law does tend to focus on this distinction. Um, a forensic search is what is generally, generally referred to as the type of search that happens uh, off-site. So it wouldn't take place between you and an agent in the moment. Um, your phone would be seized, your phone or your laptop, and uh, it, it would be searched um, later. Now, when I say off-site, uh, oftentimes devices will be taken to an another location away from the port of entry to be searched. But some ports of entry may have advanced technological tools available there to do a, uh, a deeper dive or a forensic search. Um, and that might involve hooking your device up to something like a Celebrite machine, which allows um, the government to um, essentially do a computer strip search. They can um, get, download all of the data that is on the device, and most critically, they can even acquire metadata and deleted files. Um, there are a lot of powerful forensic tools out there that uh, enable government agents to access this information. So one thing to keep in mind is that if your device is seized, it is, it is potentially subject to this type of search that could get at metadata and deleted files, which 
you know, the average device user or owner may not necessarily um, be able to control. Uh, certainly when you delete a file, it's important to remember that it can still be accessed through these forensic tools on the same device. So those are the types of searches that take place. Um, and then in terms of the, the factual context of device searches, uh, I've presented some of the numbers here, which uh, you can see on the slide. Um, from fiscal year 2012 to fiscal year 2017. And what we can see from these numbers, and these are all provided by CBP, is that from fiscal year 2012, there were about 5,000 device searches at the border every year. And in fiscal year 2016, there were 19,000. Fiscal year 2017 had approximately 30,000. So we've seen a big jump, um, in particular in the last year of the Obama administration. Uh, going from 8,500 approximately in 2015 to 19,000 in 2016. Uh, what we know from the government is that approximately 20% of the searches in 2017 were conducted on U.S. citizens. We don't have any more information than this. We don't know what the reasons are for these searches. Uh, we don't know what uh, nationality or ethnicity of the people searched. We don't know how many of those are lawyers, journalists. Um, there's not a lot of information out there beyond the aggregate data. And one of the concerns that we have at the ACLU, of course, is that um, under the, the regime of suspicionless searches, individuals can be targeted on the basis of race, eth ethnicity, or even targeted on the basis of who they are. Um, so the concerns of, of, of journalists, of activists, of dissidents, of lawyers uh, being targeted for search without cause um, is a concern of ours. So as Jumana mentioned, at the border, the legal framework is as follows. Uh, the traditional rule for searches of physical luggage has allowed the government to conduct these searches at the border without any suspicion required. Um, it's, it's an exception to the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement, and there's no probable cause or reasonable suspicion required. And the reason for this, the historic reason for this exception to the warrant requirement, is that uh, the, the government has the power to determine admissibility of people and goods. And um, therefore, when people show up at the border with their physical items, those can be searched to make sure that they are admissible um, and that there's no contraband. And uh, individuals can be questioned about their citizenship or immigration status to determine their admissibility. Now the government's position on the searches of the contents of electronic devices is that the same traditional rule applies. The current governing policies are 2009 directives issued by Customs and Border Protection and ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. I'm going to focus on the CBP directives because those are most uh, commonly at play when someone's arriving in the country at either a land border, or a seaport, or an airport. Um, CBP Directive 3340-49 says very clearly, no individual suspicion is required, searches should be documented, and should normally be conducted in the presence of the traveler. So again, this is, this is a clear statement of policy by CBP that it doesn't need individual suspicion. As I will discuss later, this is a hotly contested legal issue. We at the ACLU disagree with that position, but this is the current policy that's being implemented by the government. Now the directive says uh, searches should be normally conducted in the pre presence of the traveler. This doesn't mean that the traveler uh, will necessarily be permitted to oversee what the border agent is doing. Um, it could simply mean that the traveler is in the same room as the agent doing the search. Uh, there are exceptions, of course, but this is just something to keep in mind that according to the policy, normally any such search should happen when the individual is in the room. Uh, as I mentioned, however, with, with forensic searches, because those happen off-site or on that site but in a different room when the device is hooked up to a um, so something like a Celebrite machine, for example, those searches typically do not take place in the presence of the traveler. Now the CBP directive the, acknowledges the existence of attorney-client attorney or work product privileged material. And the language of the directive says, that an agent must seek advice from a CBP associate or assistant chief counsel before conducting a search 
if the officer suspects the content of such material may constitute evidence of a crime or otherwise pertain to a determination within the jurisdiction of CBP. This language uh, is not sufficient protection against search of attorney-client privileged material. It simply requires consultation with a superior within the executive branch, within CBP. And the language of the, of the directive itself uh, only mentions uh, a, a, a type of material that is evidence of a crime or, or evidence that would otherwise pertain to a determination within the jurisdiction of CBP. That language is not the complete scope of what constitutes uh, attorney-client privileged material or work product privileged material, and it also doesn't um, meet the full scope of the language of uh, professional ethics responsibilities, which I will discuss later, but I'm thinking specifically of Model Rule 1.6, which imposes an obligation on an attorney um, not to disclose confidential information about a client. So there is a, a wide scope of material that falls outside of the language of the directive um, where it's unclear if CBP would even consider an, uh, the requirement to seek advice as coming into play. Nonetheless, if the, the CBP associate or assistant chief counsel signs off on the search, um, attorneys could be subject to having even privileged materials searched in the absence of any individualized suspicion. This is one of our big concerns with the government's current policy and legal position. The directive additionally says that information determined to be privileged will only be shared with federal agencies that have mechanisms in place to protect appropriately such information. Uh, it's unclear what this language means, but it certainly contemplates sharing of privileged materials with other federal agencies. And in many cases, it's the sharing itself that is, of course, the concern and not whether that agency itself can protect uh, the privileged material. Now, the CBP directive specifies what, what should happen if a device is seized. So let's say that someone's at the border, they've um, they've been asked to hand over their device. Perhaps there's been an on-the-spot search, perhaps there hasn't, uh, but the agent decides to take the device for further searching. The CDP directive permits detention of devices for up to five days without extenuating circumstances. And it says that supervisory approval is needed for the detention of the device or a copy of the contents of the device once the traveler leaves the port of entry. Uh, and that approvals may be extended in seven-day increments. We have heard anecdotally um, that people can sometimes have their devices retained by uh, the government for days or weeks. Um, so, so oftentimes, even, even with uh, these limitations in place, travelers who've had their devices seized may be without information about when their device will be returned, uh, and they may be without their device for weeks on end. So the, the limits here um, don't seem to impose any real practical limitation on how long a device might be held. And then lastly, the directive says, if after search there is no probable cause to seize the information, the copies must be destroyed and the device must be returned. And it specifies that destruction must be within seven days unless supervisory approval grants 21 days. We have concerns, obviously, about um, enforcing this language of the directive. It's difficult for people who have their devices returned to necessarily know whether or not uh, the agency determined that there was probable cause to retain the information on their material, how they are defining probable cause, you know, whether it's probable cause for a range of um, potential criminal activity or whether it's simply probable cause for something within CBP's jurisdiction. Those are really important questions. Um, and if the agency does determine probable cause, then there are concerns on how long that information can be retained and with whom it may be shared. And the directive doesn't provide much information on that. Lastly, the directive says that if your device is retained by an agent at the border, there must be a receipt issued. So for every traveler who does uh, find themselves with their device seized, um, it's very important to get a receipt. That is the way to follow up with CBP to get your device back. Now this is the directive that's been in place since 2009 and as far as we know and the government has stated publicly uh, most recently that this is the policy that is still in effect. 
In April 2017, there was a muster issued to CBP agents, and parts of this muster have been made public through FOIA requests, but not entirely. Uh, it's not fully public. Nonetheless, uh, it, it's clear from this muster and from questions that have been given in response to senators' inquiries that CBP says data that is located solely in the cloud may not be searched. So all of the information that I was just providing and, and the CBP directive allowing for suspicionless searches should only apply, even by the government's own policy terms, to data that is physically resident on the device. So that means cloud-connected apps, email that's solely accessible through the cloud and not physically stored on the device should not be searched. We still have questions about how that is implemented, practically speaking. One, uh, one way to protect against your information that's in the cloud from being searched is, of course, to put the phone in airplane mode. And I'll talk about this more in practical tips, but uh, what this means is when you're crossing the border, you should put all of your devices into airplane mode so that if even a, an agent wants to do a cursory on-the-spot search of your device, that agent cannot access cloud-connected data, and they should have no reason to take the device off airplane mode because by the government's own policy, agents are not authorized to search that data. Uh, the, the open questions, by the way, uh, if, if it's of interest, are simply that it's often unclear what data is cloud-connected or not, uh, particularly if, if you're talking about an app that may push data to a, a device, um, may cache data. Uh, there can be a lot of uh, confusion about what exactly is cloud-connected or not, and so uh, we have filed a FOIA request for the complete muster to see what steps, what specific steps agents are directed to take to make sure that they do not actually access cloud stored data, and in particular when forensic searches are involved. As I mentioned, the authority to carry out these suspicionless searches is contested. Um, there have been a series of cases, I've highlighted a few here, but the, the most important thing I'll start off by saying is that Riley v. California, which I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with, is the Supreme Court case from 2014, which said that the contents of cell phones could not be searched without a warrant um, as part of the search incident to arrest exception to the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement. So people who are arrested um, cannot have their cell phone searched without uh, law enforcement getting a warrant. And the court's opinion in Riley was really a watershed, and so our position at the ACLU is, is that the Riley opinion um, makes clear that at the border, the Fourth Amendment also requires a warrant for the search of the contents of digital devices. And that warrant requirement should apply no less at the border given the very uh, severe privacy intrusion that is affected whenever digital data is searched. The volume of information that is contained on devices is unprecedented. At this point, uh, the vast majority of travelers will travel with some sort of electronic device, and the amount of information that's accessible is so intrusive that a warrant is required to adequately balance the privacy interest against the government's interest. However, there is no case that has held that a warrant is required for such searches. Before Riley, <clears throat> there was one appellate case from the Ninth Circuit, U.S. v. Cotterman, which was an en banc decision. And in Cotterman, the Ninth Circuit held that at least for forensic searches, which take place uh, off-site, this, this search took place several days after the traveler had crossed the border, those forensic searches must be conducted on reasonable suspicion. So they did impose that heightened requirement for the forensic search off-site. And while the government has not acknowledged this heightened reasonable suspicion requirement for forensic searches nationwide, um, certainly within the Ninth Circuit's jurisdiction, that is the current state of the law. And that is something to be aware of if you are coming to a port of entry or flying into an airport within the Ninth Circuit's jurisdiction, U.S. v. Cotterman says that if your device is seized and subsequently searched forensically, there is a reasonable suspicion threshold required. That decision was prior to Riley. And since Riley, 
uh, there have been a host of district court cases that have gone in different directions. Some have required reasonable suspicion for searches of electronic devices at the border, and some have not. Uh, there has not been an appellate court opinion since Riley squarely considering this question, but there are now three pending. So we may very shortly have some answers. Uh, U.S. v. Colsus is a criminal appeal in the Fourth Circuit, which was argued in October. And in that case, the defendant is arguing that uh, the search of his electronic device should only have happened with a warrant or at a minimum upon probable cause. U.S. v. Molina Isidoro is also a criminal appeal that will be argued in the Fifth Circuit in January. And U.S. v. Vergara is a criminal appeal in the Eleventh Circuit that will be argued next week. So it's quite possible that within the next few months we'll have up to three appellate decisions um, applying the, the law post Riley to determine what level of suspicion is required and whether a warrant is required for searches of electronic devices at the border. As Jumana mentioned, there's also a pending civil case uh, in which I am counsel, El Asad v. Duke, which is a case between the ACLU, the ACLU of Massachusetts, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation as counsel for 11 travelers who all had their devices searched at the border. Uh, and they are challenging their device searches and seeking injunctive relief. Um, and the argument, again, is that the government needs a warrant to, to search such uh, contents of electronic devices at the border. So, so as I mentioned, this is the state of the, of the law as it stands. Um, and we may get uh, more clarity from the appellate courts and maybe eventually the Supreme Court. And lastly, I, I want to mention that there are also First Amendment arguments that such device searches are unlawful. And uh, a District of Massachusetts case that the ACLU was counsel in in 2012, House v. Napolitano, um, did discuss those First Amendment arguments. In that case, the district court held that the mere fact that you can uh, search expressive materials did not raise an expressive concern. But if someone were to be targeted for protected First Amendment reasons, that would be a, a potential constitutional concern. So um, meaning if someone were searched solely because of their associational activities, um, that would raise a First Amendment concern. Uh, so that's another thing to keep in mind. If, if you are at a border and the questioning is such that it tends to show that you are about to be searched or you have been searched solely because of your um, First Amendment protected activity, associational activity, expressive activity, um, that's something to be aware of that that could be a, a concern to raise. The other big question that arises at the border is device password requests because uh, many people, of course, who are traveling with their devices have them password protected, and that is something that we recommend that everyone do, is have a strong and unique password on all of your devices. And uh, what may typically happen is that a border agent who wants to search your device will ask for the password or will ask you to unlock the device. Uh, in June 2017, CBP responded to Senate questions, and it stated that it has the authority to ask for assistance from a traveler in unlocking a device. But it also acknowledged that it does not condition entry of U.S. citizens based on providing a password. And uh, the advice that we have long been giving the public is U.S. citizens um, should make the choice whether to give a, a password or not. Um, and I will discuss that choice a little bit more when we talk about practical tips. But the, the important thing to know is that your ability to re-enter the country cannot be conditioned on whether or not you're willing to give up a password to your device. If you do not give up a password, your device may be seized. That's, that's something to keep in mind. That's part of the calculus that you will face if you're in that position. Um, but you should not be detained at the border and prevented from entry for that reason alone. Uh, and of course, the implications of refusing to provide a password differ based on immigration status. Lawful permanent residents also should not have their entry conditioned on providing a password, uh, although CBP has not acknowledged as much. Um, but, but they do not, um, th their, their ability to enter the country should not legally depend on that. Individuals who are visiting on a visa or, or as part of a visa waiver program risk being turned away if they are not willing to provide a password. So this is something to keep in mind, again, when you're thinking about uh, 
either you traveling, your colleagues, investigators, other people who are coming in, such as witnesses, what is their immigration status and what is their plan if they are asked for a password? And their entry is conditioned on that. So what are the practical tips and things to think about? Firstly, before you are traveling, uh, consider traveling with as little data and as few devices as possible. Obviously, the ability to do this depends greatly on the nature of your work, the reason you are traveling, and what you are doing while you are abroad. But to the extent that you have data and devices with you that you don't need, consider not traveling with them. If you do have sensitive data, you can store it in a cloud storage account and then keep your devices in airplane mode. And in fact, if you're you're really concerned, the best would be to store it in a cloud storage account that's not accessible from your device. So not something that if you turned off airplane mode with the click of a, of a button, you know, you could go through the app and, and see it. The, the best way to protect that data from being searched would be to have it in a cloud storage account that's not accessible. So you could delete the apps uh, that would make it accessible, um, delete anything that automatically has your password in it such that if you were to click on it, you could get into the cloud storage account. You should encrypt your devices with strong and unique passwords and shut them down when crossing the border. And if you have sensitive photos in a camera, the best thing to do with those is to upload those to a, a cloud storage account or a password protected device rather than leaving the digital files in the camera itself. Um, and again, all of these steps will, of course, depend on how practical it is, and, and you have to weigh the sensitivity of the information. Of course, there are also downsides to storing information in cloud stored accounts. I, I don't want to minimize those either, so you really have to sort of consider what the, the greater concern is for you, whether it's the possibility of being searched at the border or whether the uh, cloud storage account is an adequate solution for you. Certainly keep all of your devices uh, encrypted, secured with a strong password, um, and in airplane mode. Now, if you are at the border and you have been um, asked for your device for the purposes of a search of the contents, as opposed to simply running it through a scanner you know, to, to make sure that it, it is what it is, the important thing to do here is to make it clear that there is attorney-client privileged or work product privileged or other sensitive material on there. And um, the, the advice that the, the bar of the city of New York has given in its opinion on the ethical obligations is um, potentially to carry um, a business card on you or potentially um, even uh, uh, court order if you have sensitive litigation ongoing and information relating to that litigation that makes clear um, what the information is that you're carrying. Any, any documentation you have that could back up your assertion of privilege will be helpful. Uh, it will also be helpful to have the copy of the CBP directive on you so that you can point to the reference to attorney-client privilege material at the very least. Um, you know, ask the agent to follow the procedure specified in the directive of seeking advice. So um, again, you know, carrying business cards, if you have investigators or witnesses, making sure that they are traveling with documentation that states the privileged material that they have on them or any court orders that they are under um, so that the assertion of privilege can be um, documented. If uh, if the device is seized and retained at that point, it's possible the device will be searched right away, but it's also possible it won't be searched for several days or weeks. So it's important to get the receipt to take down as much information you can about the agent who took the device, the, the time, the location, so that you can later contact the agency and make clear that there's privileged material on that device and that they should not search it if they have not already done so, or if they have done so, that the copies that have been uh, downloaded or retained need to be destroyed because they are privileged. If you are asked for a password on site, uh, as I mentioned, if you are a US citizen or a lawful permanent resident, you have the choice between deciding whether to give the password or not. If you decide not to give the password, you do face the risk, as I mentioned, of having the device seized. 
if the agents are not able to search it on the spot, they may seize it so that they can attempt to get in and search it later. That's a choice that you have to make based on your assessment of whether the risk is greater in having uh, the search take place on the spot, potentially, or whether you would rather refuse to give a password, take the risk that the device is seized, and then um, seek to address that later to prevent a search or to destroy any copies that are made, or seek to have the, the government destroy any copies that are made. Uh, so, so that's a choice that I think you should consider before you arrive. Again, you may be held at the border longer if you refuse to, if you refuse to give a password. Uh, if you are a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident entitled to return, you cannot be held indefinitely. At some point, a detention at the border becomes unlawful. But certainly, you can be held for several hours beyond the time that you would otherwise be held. And again, for some people, that may be something that they are not willing to do or unable to do. So that's a consideration to take into mind as well, is whether you are able or willing to stay longer to refuse to provide a password. Uh, if you do decide to give a password, request that you be able to enter it yourself rather than writing down the password. Um, so that your password doesn't potentially end up in government notes or in a government database. So if the agent is willing, ask if you can unlock the device yourself. And again, remember that CBP policy states that in, um, in most circumstances, unless an exception applies, the search should happen in your presence. You should be able to stay in the room while the search is happening so that you can see how long the agent searched the device. Uh, if you are required to write down your password, consider changing it immediately after you leave the port of entry. Um, if you get your device back, certainly consider changing it. If you use that password for other uh, accounts, certainly consider changing it uh, because that password may remain in government files. If your device is searched on the spot and returned to you, or if the device is seized and returned to you days or weeks later, carefully note its condition. Note whether uh, any apps, applications, or other programs have been recently opened. Um, note whether any information is missing or deleted. Note whether anything is different. Uh, and in fact, I would, I would suggest that before you get to a border, you carefully note the condition of your device. Be aware of what's on there. Be aware of what apps you have recently used or not. Um, again, we have heard from people who've gotten their devices back that Certain apps were clearly opened um, that they had not opened in, in a long time, or um, files were missing, or they got a push notification that said something that didn't really make sense to them. So the more information you have going into the search about what the condition of your device is, and if you are um, observant of its condition when it's returned to you before you start immediately using it again, that can help you ascertain what exactly was searched, what was done. Um, it might help you reconstruct what material was taken. If something was deleted or destroyed, you'd certainly want to know that. So um, again, I think it's, it's good to know exactly what, what is on your device, what the condition of your device is. And when you get it back from a search, the first thing you should do is look at your device before you start using it to see what, what has been done. Uh, this is also um, helpful if you subsequently want to file a FOIA or Privacy Act request to see what materials have been retained from the device search. And this is something that is available to you as an option if your device is searched. Uh, you can file FOIA or Privacy Act requests and um, see what information the government has retained on, on, on the basis of that search. Um, Going to ethical considerations, I mentioned earlier Model Rule 1.6, which requires uh, attorneys not to share confidential information of their clients. Um, the ABA has, um, has come out with some discussion of what that means, and the, the Bar of the City of New York has put out an opinion about what that means and what reasonable steps are required for attorneys to take in light of the fact that whenever they travel internationally, they are subject to the suspicionless regime of searches at the border. Um, of course, because the bedrock requirement of reasonableness applies, there are a lot of considerations to take into account, including the practicality of the steps that you would have to take to protect the material, 
the sensitivity of it, what options are available to you. Certainly, if there is material that you do not need to take with you, as, as I mentioned, the best practice is not to take it. Um, some people choose to travel with so-called burner phones or burner laptops, meaning they're laptops you use for travel that don't contain your files or other information, but you use them to communicate when you are abroad or um, to, to, to do sort of your work while you are abroad, but they are of, of a limited purpose and therefore will also have um, a, limited, uh, a limited amount of metadata and deleted files that you would have to worry about being searched in any forensic search. That is an option to consider, although obviously it's not practical for everyone to have multiple phones or multiple laptops. So that's, that's something that people should consider. Uh, one thing that you definitely should do is identify yourself as a lawyer carrying privileged materials. And if you have, as I mentioned, witnesses, investigators, colleagues, experts traveling, they should identify themselves and have whatever documentation they have about the privileged material. Um, and, and having copies of the CBP directive is always a good idea. Um, another option that people can consider is carrying a uh, what's known as a G28 form with them. This is a form that is used by immigration authorities um, and it specifies a, a formal attorney relationship. So if you have a colleague, for example, who can um, who can f represent you for this purpose, fill out a G28 form so that if for some reason you are being detained at the border or if you have someone working with you who is not a citizen, for example, they're coming in on a visa and so they're concerned about being detained and uh, searched, they can show the G28 form and they can request to speak with their lawyer, the person who assigned the G28 form, or at the very least, um, the agency is on notice of who they should tell the, the lawyer listed on the G28 form um, if, if the person at the border is being held for a long time or is incommunicado. Uh, this is an option to consider. As I mentioned, for citizens and green card holders who are entitled to return, they should not be detained um, solely for refusing to permit a search. But again, I know that many of you will have colleagues and, and, and other people working with you who may be here on visas, and so for them, I would consider having the G28 form. Um, and I will leave it there and turn it over to questions. Thank you. Thank you for that, Aisha. And I think uh, you should have gotten the information, but if you have questions, you should email them to me, Jimena, at jmusa at nacdl dot org. Um, and, but if it's all right with you, Aisha, I have a couple of questions myself. Um, on the, you know, you talked quite a bit about passwords and, you know, what to do if asked about your password, entering yourself. Um, I would love if you could talk a little bit about, as we know, lots of phones now use biometrics, whether it's your fingerprint, it's your face, it's your iris scan to open the phone. Um, what should people consider in that context? Are they treated differently? Are they treated the same? You know, what are the, the ramifications, I guess, of using that versus a, a password you have to digitally enter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great question. There is currently, um, there, there, there is a contested legal issue about um, the Fifth Amendment uh, concerns over um, whether providing a password is testimonial as opposed to, let's say, a thumbprint, a fingerprint, or a face scan. Th this is a, a debate that's ongoing um, right now, and um, some people who are concerned that a thumbprint or a face scan would not be protected um, by the Fifth Amendment may choose to have a password requirement on their phone. So it, it wouldn't be accessible by just a thumbprint, but just a password, so that they could invoke a Fifth Amendment privilege against providing that password. I think that concern at the border is less, um, is less of a concern, practically speaking, because um, there you're not in a context where there's potentially a court order uh, requiring you to do anything. CBP has said that the, it may ask for assistance from travelers, but, um, but that they may not be denied entry, at least for citizens and lawful permanent residents, they may not be denied entry for refusing to provide the password. And so the same should apply to um, a thumbprint, for example. If, if CBP's position is that 
they are asking for the traveler to assist, but if the traveler does not assist, um, you know, nonetheless, they cannot be denied entry. That distinction shouldn't matter so much. But again, if, if in an abundance of caution, you feel more comfortable with a password, you could certainly switch your devices before crossing the border if you normally have a, a, a thumbprint requirement or a face scan uh, to unlock it. You could switch it to a long and strong password. All right, and so I'm still going to go with a couple of my questions because I was writing these down as you spoke. Um, when it comes to the question of taking the device elsewhere for a forensic search um, and even copying the device, could you talk through sort of what might be contained? Is there a particular notice given? What does that notice look like? Um, what are the ramifications of what can the copied information be used for? I mean, I think obviously from the perspective of our membership, you're talking about the government that is prosecuting your client also being able to access, you know, all the information in your preparation of your case in defense of your client. So it's, it's sort of particularly offensive, just the entire notion in and of itself. So I, I would love to hear a little bit more about the question of taking it offsite, the copying of the device, you know, what, what are the pieces that go with that? Sure. So as I mentioned, if your device is seized, um, you may not be given any more information than just it's being taken for a search. You know, the agent may say, you are free to go, but your, your device is being retained by us and you should get a receipt. And the default in the CBP directive is that it can only be held for five days, but, but as the directive shows, that doesn't mean anything practically because that time period can be extended. And we have heard of people having their devices held for days or weeks. It is a big concern at that point that uh, the government could essentially copy the entirety of the contents of the device, including the metadata and the deleted files. And, um, and the, the limit on sharing it in the terms of the CBP directive is simply whether the other federal agency has appropriate mechanisms in place to protect it. So I think at that stage, this is a big concern. It's one of the concerns we highlight in, uh, in, our, in our cases, that this regime of suspicionless searches essentially allows the government to use the border as a dragnet. If it couldn't get the information either through a domestic warrant or because of um, privilege protections through litigation, um, it could nonetheless treat the border as a dragnet and target individuals to download um, the entirety of the information on their devices and then share it um, without any clear limits. So again, as I mentioned, if this happens to you, if you have a device that is seized, um, you know, the, the, the possibility that it's searched right away exists, but it's also quite possible that it won't be searched for at least several days or weeks. So at that point, you know, I think it's really important to consider potential legal options, um, certainly to um, speak to the agency when you're out of the sort of immediacy of the border context, you're not at an airport or a port of entry, um, you know, to make clear that if the search has not already, already happened, um, the, the CBP or ICE uh, investigators who, or whoever is doing the search is going to come across privileged material and potentially material that if shared with the very agency that are prosecuting the clients whose material is on there. Um, and, and certainly I think, you know, that would raise a whole host of due process concerns as well. And, and you know, uh, those are all concerns that you all are aware of and, and, and can raise. Um, if, the if the information has already been copied from the device before you're able to make those arguments fully, um, then I think you certainly have to make an argument that all copies of that have to be destroyed. As I mentioned, for individuals, oftentimes FOIA or Privacy Act requests have been useful. They take time, however. And if uh, time is a great concern, that, that may not be the best route for you, but um, certainly being able to identify exactly what was copied, exactly what was retained, and what was shared so that you can track down all that material and ensure that it's been destroyed. Uh, those are the, the things that I would suggest because the, the risk of forensic search really is um, a critical one. Again, keep in mind that at least in the Ninth Circuit's jurisdiction, a forensic search can only take place upon reasonable suspicion, but um, that may not be sufficient protection depending on, on what the claim of reasonable suspicion is. 
All right, so we, we got a couple of questions, but I, I want to ask one more first, and I'm just going to remind people of the email address, which is jmusa at nacdl.org. Um, so the, the last question of mine, and I, I will also point people to uh, NACDL's primer that was linked to from, uh, from the CLE, uh, which is one of the, the thoughts or strategies that we had ahead of time was getting a protective order from the judge before you travel. Um, so I know you, you are suggesting that people travel with the CBP directive. Um, my understanding of the directive, and I can be mistaken, is that it applies to attorneys. And so how does that then play out for you know, investigators, translators, witnesses, or other folks who may be carrying the same exact privileged information uh, but don't have the attorney label? I think as I mentioned that documentation is really important and and probably it's a good idea to have a letter very clearly laying out um, what you know what material this person is carrying and how and why it is protected by a privilege um, and being as clear as possible because you know I, I agree with you it may be easier for uh, an attorney with a bar card or a documentation of being an attorney to invoke this but um, because the concern about this material extends beyond, uh, I think it's very important for, for other people, witnesses, investigators, and so on, to be um, carrying that information. And, and to be carrying, potentially, if, it, if you're very concerned, the G28 form that I mentioned, which has the attorney's information on there. Okay, and so I, I'll also say in our guide there is also the recommendation that you, you know, this sort of the buddy system, right, which is notifying somebody when you're supposed to land so that if you are, because you cannot use your phone while you're in customs, anybody who's traveled knows that, so that they know if, you know, it's been a particularly long period of time, they haven't gotten anything from you that you may be detained. Uh, so moving on to some other questions that we got. One question is, what is there... Um, Anything in particular, whether it's documentation or something else, that should be sought in discovery if, uh, you know, at some point there has been a device seized, um, you know, some kind of forensic search, and you're not, you know, you, you talked about trying to sort of stop it before it happened, potentially if it already happened, what would you recommend people are asking for in terms of documentation of what was done or what to look for mm -hmm. in discovery in their cases? I would recommend that you seek the same information that you would seek through, say, a FOIA or a Privacy Act request, which is what type of search was done, what were the tools used so that you can evaluate after the fact, you know, what, what the scope of the intrusion was, and then specifically what information was searched. I, I would even ask for copies of the information that was searched, retained, and shared, and, and to know specifically all of those things to the extent that you can. Um, that's, you know, that's the only way you could figure out if, in fact, you know, privileged material was seen and, and possibly seen by the prosecuting entity. Okay. So the next question is about, you know, what if you're still analog? So <laughs> what if you are the person who still has physical files that you're carrying back and forth across a border? Um, what is or isn't the distinctions or what protections can be put in place for the actual paper mm -hmm. versus something you know that can be put on airplane mode or in a cloud or you know you can't have burner files it's your files mm -hmm. it's a good question for the physical materials I would say if it's truly sensitive your best bet is not to carry it on you because the traditional rule about searching luggage uh, without suspicion will apply and uh, you know the Supreme Court in a case in Ramsey um, sort of considered but did not address the question of what happens if, uh, say, customs inspectors read the contents of, of mail, international mail that is sent across the border. And, and the, first, the First Amendment question um, was not dealt with because the Supreme Court decided that case in a context in which customs inspectors were prohibited by regulation from reading the contents of, of the envelopes, the, the, the mail inside. Um, there's no uh, you know, there's no case that I'm aware of that would protect you from having someone seeing the contents of your file. Of course, if it's unavoidable and you have the file on you, you should say, you know, these are papers and they're attorney-client privileged, and if the agent has, um, you know, no reason to doubt that they're simply papers, they may not search them. Certainly recommend doing that, but, 
but those physical materials are likely to be searched just as much as anything in your luggage is likely to be searched. So, uh, you know, you should consider that before carrying them across the border. All right, and, and I could also see a situation where you have an original document you know that you obtain while you're overseas investigating and you need to carry it back so I think it's a I, I don't know if sealing it in an envelope yeah I mean this is just me throwing things out there um, may add some added protection uh, so another question we got is about the FOIA Privacy Act process that you referenced which certainly does take time can you walk through some of the steps of what does that look like yes yeah, so the Privacy Act and, and I should um, make it clear that these protections of the Privacy Act only apply to citizens and lawful permanent residents. Um, so someone who's not in those categories will not necessarily be able to go through this, but it's a, it's a process of filing an administrative request. And the Privacy Act gives people, uh, citizens and lawful permanent residents, the entitlement to see their records and to make corrections to them. Um, and so, uh, you know, without knowing in advance what information has been retained or what notes the agents made about your encounter with them. It's hard to say whether you could have any um, sort of substantive redress, but the most critical part of that is being entitled to see what is being held on you. And so, um, you know, as part of that request, again, I think you can ask for the notes from that encounter, um, files or documentation that are held about the type of search that was done. Uh, you know, was it was it forensic? If so, what forensic tools were used? And then the contents of the information that were retained, including with which agencies they were shared. Um, we at the ACLU have at various times helped people file these requests. Uh, again, they can take time. A FOIA request, of course, I think is in some ways um, more basic, it's, you know, you can file a FOIA request and specify the types of documents that you want. So you can specify, you know, I want information about any search of my device that was conducted, the contents of the information that were retained, anyone they were shared with, you know, any records of the sharing. Uh, you, can, you can specify what you want in the FOIA request. Um, the exemptions may come into play there, but certainly if you're requesting information about yourself, uh, that that is um, that is permissible under FOIA. So rather than requesting information about someone else, it's best to have the person request their own files under FOIA. Um, and again, that can take time. And certainly, you know, you may get the information you want. You may have to consider whether you want to litigate your FOIA request if there's really a concern that you're not getting the full picture that you're entitled to under FOIA. Um, but this, this, to start the process is is filing the administrative request. And so I also, um, I think, hang on, I got another email. But I, you know, I, in, in terms of looking at that, I just want to point out to people that in our primer, we also link to uh, EFF's digital privacy at the U.S. border um, manifesto, which is basically a very, very thorough uh, document going through the various um, strategies you might employ to protect your digital devices and all the different things that you may consider. Um, I, I was hoping, and this is again a question to me, and then I can go back to these, but uh, you could lay out, and I know we did in our primer connect to the complaint in the al Assad case that you're doing, but if you could lay out some of the, um, you know, the facts of that case so we get a sense of, you know, what it was that happened and what you all are litigating mm -hmm. as we watch this case go forward. Sure. So al Assad v. Duke is a lawsuit on behalf of 11 individuals, uh, 10 U.S. citizens and one lawful permanent resident. and. All of them were subject to device searches when they were coming back across the U.S. border. The circumstances vary, um, and you know some people were subject to searches on the spot where their devices were seized um, and maybe taken to a back room and searched for some period of time. Other people had their devices taken and retained. Uh, we have a couple of people in the lawsuit whose devices had not been returned at the time we filed suit. Uh, all of them were never subsequently charged with anything. And um, there was no reason for the device search to take place, uh, no, no reason that we think is adequate under the Fourth Amendment. It was you know, part of this suspicionless regime. Uh, we have a couple of journalists who are plaintiffs, and 
um, you know, they're journalists who travel abroad and, uh, you know, the concern we have in particular about that is sensitive source material. Um, even a cursory search of a journalist's phone could reveal recently dialed numbers, contact lists, um, you know, text messages. That alone, e even just the, you know, so-called metadata of who they're in contact with can be highly sensitive. Um, so that concern is present. Um, we have one family of U.S. citizens and the, 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 the two parents uh, who are traveling with their children were detained for um, many hours at the U.S. border um, while their daughter was sick. They were um, at a land crossing and they were held for, I, I believe it was close to seven hours while um, you know, they were uh, undergoing routine, uh, repeated questioning and having their devices uh, searched and then taken. So we have a lot of different circumstances present. We've got um, you know, a, a, an engineer um, for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory who was returning from a personal trip abroad who had his device searched. Um, we have business people. Um, we have, you know, as I mentioned, journalists. It's just people from a, a, a range of backgrounds, and um, and you know, I think that the plaintiffs really demonstrate the the scope of harm this policy caused. Um, you know, there th there's there's a there's a range of reasons that they um, care very much about their privacy. Uh, some of them have professional reasons. Some of them, it's their personal reasons. But all of them, um, you know, were subject to this warrantless, suspicionless regime. Okay. Um, thanks for that. And the the last question that we got was about. I know you referenced frequently um, getting letters from investigators and witnesses and other folks. Um, one of the things that we had in our primer was getting specifically a Covell letter. Is that something you can talk about? Yes, I'm not an expert on getting a Covell letter, but certainly I think that makes a lot of sense because um, it's quite possible, as you said, the CBP directive may not necessarily lead border agents to think about non-attorneys. Um, court orders in advance, especially if the travel is for purposes of the case and there's, um, you know, it's very clear that when you're traveling, you will have to bring back sensitive materials on your devices. Uh, you know, in, in a lot of cases, it's just unavoidable because the purpose of the travel is to you know acquire that material. So, um, you know, I, I don't know the the process of of getting a letter, but I think that any documentation you can have is is good. And in particular, if you've got people traveling who are not U.S. citizens or or lawful permanent residents, I think they need to have the most documentation possible. All right, so I, I'm just going to take the last question for myself before we wrap up. Um, there's a couple of times when you've referred to both being able to access metadata and being able to access deleted files. Um, I, I would love if you could sort of flesh that out more in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, what come what information can be gathered from metadata and also when it comes to deleted files, you know, if, if that is something that somebody um, I mean, you talked about putting the phone airplane mode, deleting apps, this and that. If they can actually recapture all these deleted things, you know, how does one go about really deleting things, or is it not just not possible? And folks need to understand that deleting does not mean not accessible. I mean, is there yeah. a place where deleting actually means deleting? Yeah. Uh, so, short of having a lot, you know, if, if you have an in-house technical expert who can work with you on how to really you know, make sure your devices are stripped clean. That's one thing. But speaking from the perspective of what are the practical steps most of us can take, people should be aware that if you have a laptop and you delete, let's say you have a, a lot of Word files and they're work product privileged and you delete them and you delete them from the recycling bin and you do everything that you as a normal computer user can do, they, they may be still accessible in a forensic search. Uh, it, again, it's one of the concerns we have with the extreme invasiveness of the potential search that could happen. Um, the government sometimes argues that <clears throat> device searches are permissible because people can control what they bring across the border in the same way that they can control their physical lug luggage. But that's just not true, practically speaking, given the technological tools that are now available. Um, even someone making their best effort to delete, you know, short of hiring, uh, you know, 
someone to, to do a very custom job on your devices for you, you can't be sure that that won't be accessible. And similarly with metadata, um, what I mean is things like, you know, the times that you used the, the device or when you downloaded or deleted certain things, um, programs, for example, all of that information that it may be hard for the average computer or device user to mask or delete, um, which could be accessible. And so I think people should be aware of that. And again, if you are very concerned about the possibility of a forensic search that you wouldn't be able to prevent, um, consider leaving a device that you have a lot of history on that you've been using for years behind and traveling with another device. Because, you know, I think the risk increases, again, the longer you've been using a device, the more metadata, the more deleted files, the more likely it is that you won't even necessarily remember what you had deleted several years previously. Um, so I think the, the, the main goal I have is just to make everyone aware that um, you may, you may take your best efforts, but if you've been using a device for a long time in particular, just, just know that you may not be able to strip it bare, or at least there may be information there that a forensic search could, could gather that you weren't thinking of. Okay, well, thank you, Aisha, for joining us this morning and talking us through this, and thanks for everybody who joined our webinar. Um, it, will be, uh, it was recorded, will be available later on our website for you to view again or share, and uh, we hope you join us again.